All right, so joining us here in the show is uh, John Netto, and uh, uh, John is the author of uh, The Global Macro Edge, and uh, certainly a trader that loves to talk the Fed, so I think that that's what we're going to talk about. Welcome, John. It's great to be here, Patrick, and Kevin, thanks for having me, guys. No problem. So, so John, I want to start off, like, next week we have the Fed coming out, uh, the FOMC meeting, and uh, and now there's all this banter about interest rates and whether there's going to be a cut coming up soon. You love to trade these types of events. Uh, and so uh, let's start off with just uh, you telling us how you trade these events. How do you set this all up? What's your approach to, to trading an FOMC meeting like this? Sure. So I take a top-down approach to establishing where possible you know price and opportunities occur. And whether it's a Fed event or key tier one economic data or an election, if you get a regime shift or a period of potential price discovery, um, it sets up for um, a trader like myself who's a little more nimble, and I imagine a lot of viewers out there as well, an opportunity to put on um, trades that offer great um, returns per unit of risk. So a common metric out there that people use to measure risk-adjusted returns would be like a sharp ratio. Well, I, I created something called a netto number. And so when I assess a strategy, I like to look at how a strategy, um, what the potential for that return per unit of risk is, or, or at, at a basic level, at a second um, dimensional level, what kind of risk-adjusted returns it can generate. Now, these events, to get to that, to why that's relevant, these events like the Fed or like Tier 1 data or like maybe a big election or a news outbreak, like maybe a, a tariff announcement, offer or can offer greater risk-adjusted return potential than other strategies. And so the, the goal is, is it, well, let me identify what is it about these events that cause that? How can I trade these events? How can I model these events? And so in particular, the Fed is one of those events that um, provides opportunity where we can get into asymmetrical risk reward ratio. So I can risk one to make three or four or 10 or 15, um, both from understanding the nuance of the event and through proper trade structure. And so that's sort of a top-down view of, of why I like one to identify regime shifts or big events, but more specifically, um, why I like to trade the Fed as well. So, so it's Kev here. Um, so John, I, I'm just dying to know what, how you're setting up for this next Fed meeting. It's uh, it, it's probably one of the better events out there in terms of there's never been the, this much kind of uncertainty in terms of how where the Fed's headed and what and what they will specifically do. So what are you looking for this next week? Sure. So I, I think to preface what you what you said is that when you look at why there's so much opportunity, why there's so much uncertainty, that's an indictment of this of this pal Fed. If we go back to December and, and a little bit of history, I think is appropriate to set the stage for next week's meeting. If we go back to December, uh, there were many. No, there were enough. There, there was there was a, a silent. There was there were a contingent of people that were calling for the Fed to not hike in December. If we remember on, on December nineteenth, two thousand eighteen, uh, a number of people or people did not want the Fed to hike, and were concerned that they were not adjusting to what was quickly becoming or what was beginning to see some erosion in the data out there. Concerns over China, the trade talks, all those things. Um, and, fed, and, and, and this was right after in October where, where Powell basically said that we're on autopilot. So when you look at what the Fed did in December, when they came out and they commented that there'd be a few more cuts, and then again during the Powell press conference in December, he gave a very um, hawkish impression, that led to a 600 basis point sell-off in the S&P 500. Merely two and a half weeks later, Powell sat down, I believe, at the Economic Club on, on January 4th and actually talked about how patient he could be, aware of just what mistake had happened. He'd done a total about faith. Now fast forward to the January 30th meeting, and and those th that patient term, in essence, the, the meaning they would not hike, was memorialized in that January 30th or January 31st 31st statement. We now go to March, where the Fed dropped the number of the dot plots down, which again they became even more dovish. Which, if you follow the history of the Fed, the March meetings can be very dovish. There's a seasonality factor to that, and 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 on top of that, we have a uh, we have a uh, them, you know, commenting on on the mortgage-backed uh, securities as well, and then we, then we go to to May, um, and May they threw us a bone um, in terms of of just their assessment of the economy, and even during the press conference, Powell talked about inflation being transitory. That May first meeting that we had, as you recall, where he sat there. I mean, this was right two days before the Trump tweet on that Sunday night that really reactivated the trade wars again. So you've seen this oscillation. You've seen um, the Fed, which resembles really not much more than the rest of us. They are far more reactive to data 
than they are proactive in, in leading us. And so when you have a Fed that is as reactive as the Fed is, it creates opportunity of what are they going to say next? So now reflect that, Kevin and, uh, and Patrick, against this ecosystem of liquidity that exists in the market. If the Fed is changing their mind, and if as a result of them changing their mind or them providing um, new, fresh perspectives that the market wasn't ready for on, on a range of topics, then people have to restructure their portfolios. There's not enough liquidity in the market for people to, 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 meet, to instantaneously rebalance their portfolios or, or, or restructure their, how to, the composition of their portfolio. So that's where it gives me and other traders out there who have a model to score these events and identify what components are a part of that to take advantage of that, given the, the vehicle of electronic trading. So, John, it's Patrick here. So the question I have for you, you've obviously been uh, watching and modeling many of these past meetings. Uh, for, compared right. to uh, the, the past few um, uh, Fed meetings, how important do you think that this one here in June is on a, on a relative basis to some of the past ones? Is this, is it, this one potentially have a big surprise factor? I think so, and thank you for for not letting me off the hook there because I got a little embedded in my in my process and didn't answer the original part of that first question. So thank you for bringing me really back in. Um, I need some of that. Uh, <laughs> yes, I think there is a, a deal for surprise because what, what effectively what we've had is that the market has you know if you look at the Fed funds futures, look at euro dollar curve, has looked at you know that there will be three cuts this year coming into you know, coming into today Friday um, you know yeah. June fourteenth, and I think that that's a bit optimistic. And so when you have the potential of, of one, you know, where financial conditions have gone, what the, what the yield curve has done, the state of economic data out there, we did have some strong retail sales this morning, which, which definitely caught people off guard. To me, how the Fed is going to toe that line between not panicking, all right, because the, the world market's slowing down, but what guys will they do that in? I believe that this meeting and where they're going to toe that line will be how they use um, not reaching their inflation targets as, as the way to make that happen. So I'm going to be looking for specifically, how does the Fed address inflation? Are inflation pressures muted? Is it more structural? Powell used the word transitory in his May 1st press conference to describe um, the lower inflation rates right now. Well, that's kind of problematic because, I don't know, the CPI this week, the payroll number last week with average hourly earnings, um, you know, he even referenced to, to, to indicate why it was transient, the Dallas trimmed mean, which is like, a lot of us are like, huh? <laughs> Since when? You know, so, so the Fed has a way of justifying their opinions. They can find the numbers to do it. So it'll be interesting this week, how, or next week, how Powell addresses the inflation factor. I think he'll do it in a way that says, listen, because of inflation, we may need to do a, a sort of maintenance cut. All right. And that's something that we are prepared to do and stand by. And I think under that guy, he's going to not let the market get too euphoric. On the other hand, he's not going to um, let people think that, you know, that, that the economy is crashing either. That he'll, he'll couch these interest rate cuts as more in line with maintenance because it is more of an inflation issue, not because of a trade issue. Because we all know the trade concerns can dissipate. You know, we have a G20 meeting coming up. All right. Yeah. How is Powell going to commit to one thing? Then the G20 comes a week later. And he's a fool again because, oh, my gosh, you're going to cut. You're going to cut two times now. And we have a trade deal. And all of a sudden, you know. Employment to three point six percent. Unemployment three point six percent. What's the Fed doing? They're getting whipped around. Yeah. So right. John, but the, I, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, Patrick. No. I was going to no. just say. Um, so I agree with your your analysis that he's in a very t tough spot in terms of how to stick handle what the market is expecting versus what he wants to do. And you mentioned the fact that there's three cuts priced into there and the fact that uh, that's what the market is expecting. I, I personally don't see how he's going to give the market all the dovish kind of uh, soothing words that they're looking for. And that this is, is setting up for something that is a kind of sell the news on the kind of fixed income side, especially on the short term side, or the short, short end of the curve. What is your thoughts there? Like, how do you like how would you set up a specific trade going into this Fed um, announcement? Well, I think there's a couple of ways. Um, one is you can look at the curve itself, all right? If, if, first of all, regardless of what he does, there should be sufficient time for us to react. And that's part of my process is that while I don't take particularly large positions going into the event, sometimes I do. There are structures that exist and opportunities out there. 
I oftentimes just wait after and use my proprietary scoring process and modeling to grade the event and then, you know, refract that through, all right, you know, was Pal able or was Pal able to tow the line? Was he able to like both satisfy doves and hawks? So the answer is no. Well, then you can sell risk. All right. Um, you, you can, you, you can maybe buy the dollar, sell the euro, um, you know, what, what gold is doing, um, maybe attack certain parts of, you know, the, the, the se sector baskets, which would re represent that. Um, you know, one thing in particular that also goes into that, which is a great question is, well, how would I play that? We're on a 24 hour news cycle. So like, look at this morning, Trump is making, you know, Trump is talking this morning about trade stuff, but given the perspective of things, how we approach that cycle dictates even come next Wednesday for this meeting, what you want to do. Have treasuries have, have maybe euro dollars sell off, and, and you know, in the two days leading up to that, that would be a little bit different than if we're going in at highs. So, to what degree the positions are there, kind of plays a factor. There. Let's get specific though, because that's what I just talked about. It's a little bit abstract. All right. Um, for me, no, no. But actually, can one second? Can yeah. before you go specific, can I just jump in there? Because I think that's a great please, point. Please. So, um, yeah. you're arguing that what you'll do instead of betting in front of the number, you'll get the number or the event. You'll sure, look at the sure. event and, and, and that sure. process of the market uh, discounting that in new information from the event isn't instantaneous. And I no, guess it's not. more, inst yeah. right. And, and I, if I give, maybe I, if I understand you correctly, it's might be instantaneous in treasury, I mean, Euro dollar futures or the short end of the curve, they, because that's a little bit of math. It's probably easier to do, but then the process of, of, of adjusting your portfolio based upon the feds new language or direction is takes a, a longer period. And, and does that period take you know, hours, you know, days, weeks, like how long are you playing after an event like the Fed's uh, announcement? Great question. So that can be anywhere from one minute. I, I built proprietary software that processes and goes through the statement and synthesizes that information. So I do all the work beforehand. So this is like a six or seven day period, even now that I'm building these models out that are going to go in and synthesize the information. So to your point, I'd say, okay, um, let's, you know, we'll process this. This can take one minute, depending, also depending on the enormity of the surprise. If it's only a modest surprise, you may not get that big of a reaction depending on market positioning going in. If it's a big surprise, let's, let's say December, for example, when, when, when Powell you know, gave no inclination you know, back to December 2018 that, that, that they were done hiking, you saw people caught off guard by that. People were, were hoping, anticipating, expecting, whatever the word is, that he would sound a little more dovish and he would be a little more open that things may be changing, that the, 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 the winds may be shifting. He wasn't. The S&P sold off 600 basis points over the following three days. Conversely, in, on following the January meeting and, and the March meeting, we had you know sufficient rallies following those meetings in, in risk. And so when there are sea changes, this stuff takes time um, to, to process. So to your point, could be a day, could be a minute, could be an hour. Um, but again, if you want to find the risk reward trades that pay you really well, being in the first five to 15 to 30 minutes, um, following this new piece of information is ideally the best time to do it. And having tools that can help synthesize that information is what I've spent a lot of time and a lot of resources to create. Right. Okay. But often after a fed meeting, the S and P gyrates around and like you, you get sure. this and it, and it ends up being uh, you know, you have to have a, a, a very good stomach to, to weather the ups and downs because we, you get big moves. So are you often fading that move and like, or you don't, you, Sometimes you're going with it. Sometimes you're fading it and it doesn't really matter. And then you're taking it off kind of the next day when, when the market settles down and figures it out. Is that kind of a typical reaction? God, I love your question. I love your question, man. This is like, thanks for teeing this up. Um, Cause I, I forgot to mention this. Um, I think that's the hardest part of trading the fed. And the reason why it's hard is that people don't have the tools to synthesize the information. Know that that big spike, should I be buying that big spike and going with the trade? Or should I be fading that big spike because it's, it's inconsequential information that's just, that's just come out? And what I've done is create software that by going through my model, my four-part model, that quickly synthesizes literally in less than one second that goes in and answers all these questions. I say, listen, what does the statement say about rates? That's the first part of the model, the path of rate hikes. What does the statement say about you know, the assessment of the economy? What does the statement say about specifically inflation? And then are there idi any idiosyncratic variables that are in that? It aggregates all of those. I built out multiple contingency plans, all right? And based on the assessment of those four inputs in my model, I then say, okay, 
there's a spike here, but there was no material news about any of those four components. So what can I do with this spike? I can fade it. Oh my goodness. They talk about um, that they were still, in December, they're still gonna hike. Um, they're still bullish on the economy. They're still good. So there, there appears to be no inclination at all that they're gonna shift their tone. It's time to sell the S&P 500, okay? And knowing which parts of the paragraph to look at, knowing which things the markets are keyed on because there's a, a very idiosyncratic aspect to this, to where what the market focused on in this Fed meeting or on this election or on this Brexit news is different than it was six months, nine months, 18 months ago. So that nuance is very hard to quantitatively model if you don't have the qualitative um, understanding and holistic understanding of, of what is specifically setting up and then how the markets themselves um, have been behaving um, um, leading up to the event. All right. Uh, so, John, I, I want to take this a little bit bigger picture uh, because sure. uh, out in Chicago last week, uh, I think, uh, it, well, nothing, but there was, a, a, the, in the language of the Fed, uh, they basically redefined what they typically would have called the zero lower bound of interest rates right. now, and they changed the right. language to the effective lower bound, opening the window to potentially, uh, at least some people are implying that it's leading to potentially the idea of negative interest rates. And I thought sure. this was fascinating. So and now obviously we were just talking about how to trade the Fed number itself. But when we're talking bigger picture here, do you think that that was uh, really important? Where do you, what do you think this means in, in, in your perspective? I think when it comes to understanding the Fed and specifically with this, with this mention is that the Fed likes to float ideas you're talking about the Fed has the most economists of any organization in the world, um, more, more economic PhDs than any organization in the world. These ideas, you know, um, are, are out there. Uh, I don't think that, and maybe I'm, I'm you know, misinterpreting this, but I don't think zero interest rates or negative interest rates, a little ZERP policy for the, for the U.S. Is, is anytime soon. But I think, and again, and, and just think about that, okay? If I was to say to you, I believe we're going to have negative rates, well, if you were to get long Fed fund futures, you're getting long the euro dollar curve last week, you'd be okay right now, but at a practical level, all right, what are you going to do? Buy two year treasuries from here? And when you look at them on the chart, because we're already factoring the 75 basis points of cuts this year. Yeah. So it's important to separate and distinguish these theoretical academic esque type of mentions versus what's eminently practical. And the Fed, I'll give them this, um, maybe not Powell per se. But the Fed at least postures or at least holds themselves that they try not to become like week to week day traders, if you will, and that things happen gradually. I mean, just look at the balance of risk statements on their statement. You know, they were roughly balanced for a year and a half or two years, despite, you know, many of us thinking at one point in time that, that the balance of risk should be shifted to the upside. Conversely, I would say now that maybe those balance of risk should be shifted to the downside. Okay. So now that was removed altogether, but there are aspects of the Fed statement and the Fed messaging. They could be, become very inert. And so academic aspects like that, whether it's, you know, discussing that or discussing them, you know, the Fed puts out also like um, every five years an assessment of income inequality, 2013, that very famous piece on income inequality. So they do have these broader academic themes. Um, how relevant or more importantly, monetizable those themes are to us or even for the more majority portfolio managers um, is a much more tenuous endeavor. All right. So I'm going to jump. I'm going to yeah. jump in here because I I think that you're echoing what David Rosenberg talked about last year when I can't remember if it was the San Francisco Fed or the St. Louis Fed, but somebody introduced a paper that went through the last um, kind of recession, the Great Recession, and talked about the fact that had we gone to negative rates, how much this would have helped the economy. And this was a dramatic shifting in terms of the Fed's policy. And Rosenberg kept saying, to, you know, highlighting this, saying that the Fed is getting us ready for negative rates. And that's the first step that they do is they introduce a paper and they sure. put it into their kind of minutes and stuff. So I think you're you're bang on correct and, and uh, echoing very much what Rosenberg is talking about. I personally think it's a disastrous policy and that negative rates are obviously, you know, a terrible road to go down and how the Fed is convincing itself that this is a is, is something that we should be doing is, is mind boggling stupid. And we all we have to do is look at Europe to know that this is is ridiculous but you know we're traders and we have to trade what's 
in front of us instead of what we want it to be. Um, so I agree with you completely. And uh, do you have any thoughts about, you know, Europe and, and, and negative rates in general, like their effectiveness? Not so much insofar as, okay, listen, there are two, th- th- there are two skill sets out there, all right, when it comes to doing what we do. There's the analytical skill set, which you're going to construct and put together great things. And then there's the skill of making money, all right? And making money is a unique skill all into itself. It requires, obviously, the ability to analyze and construct trades, but more important, how to execute those trades and identify on a return, on a cost-benefit analysis, where will I get my biggest bang for the buck? It does mean more good as an event trader to analyze Draghi's inclinations during press conferences, okay, and to identify bull movements, all right, then to do a more protracted study because the risk profile of trying to say, okay, I think negative rates are effectively going to cause booms or bo- my, my boom model says that because of negative rates and because of this structure that booms should be trained at minus 40 basis points in the next year and they're at minus 10 right now. Okay, let me put on this position for 12 months. Well, the risk profile of that, Kevin, is not as good as the ability to be caught in or involved in a repricing of the market where liquidity affords you an opportunity to, re- to achieve above average risk adjusted returns. And so for me, those kind of questions are interesting from a table perspective and provide a more broader narrative because they can distill down to a one or two day event that maybe if that gets mentioned by Draghi, like, oh, we, we like zero interest rates or reserve policy, blah, blah, blah. Well, then that can cause a 20 or 30 pip spike in the euro. Maybe that's worth scalping because you have that context. But in terms of larger portfolio construction and finding great risk adjusted trades it's not as conducive john right. that is like so one second i just want to say one thing patrick i love this guy he uh he doesn't want to sit around and argue about what should be or what you know what policies you i don't know, care um, i don't care exactly no. i think that is such a great way on twitter i see so many people sitting around arguing how the world should be instead of worrying about what the next trade is and i think that is such a refreshing and terrific answer i you know i wish i had given it all right. Well, I want to leave John with one last question. All right. So uh, we, we've been messing around with this recent video from Trump uh, was, was suggesting that uh, if he had someone else in place at the Fed, uh, they wouldn't have raised interest rates as much as they did. And he's kind of basically uh, throwing Powell under the bus, saying that they've tightened too much and that the stock market would have uh, should have been much higher and that they shouldn't have been draining the liquidity. Uh, what's your take? Did uh, did Powell overshoot? Is is Trump onto something, or is just Trump, or Trump just being Trump? There's two components of this. Um, I think we can't answer that question unless we really hearken on Fed independence. And there's no reason because December was a disaster. The hike in December was a mistake. That's beyond a doubt. The fact that the Fed's now looking to, to cut 75 basis points this year is kind of all you need to know. Not all you need to know, but but it's definitely suggested that that hike was a mistake, and that Trump objectively is correct in his frustrations about that. However, if we understand what preceded that Fed event, if we understand that the, the president effectively through Twitter and through his channels demand that the Fed not hike, that the Fed be, end quantitative tightening and put the pressure and, and ultimately create an optic situation where the Fed's independence is questioned, I'm not as critical of what the Fed did in December because that could have been back channeled and they could have collaborated together to have avoided that. But that wasn't a process that either the White House or the Fed, you know, could effectively put together. So speaking objectively, with the benefit of hindsight, but also at the time, I was in the camp that said the Fed should not hike, although, you know, it was like 90% price in or 90% chance of them hiking at that meeting. They should not have hiked. They should have rolled back QT, given what was setting up, and simply couched it as a pause and then something that they could have could resume later. That's not what happened. They plowed through. They hiked. We saw what happened in the markets. He suggested not only did they hike, they kept. They suggested that further hikes were coming. Okay, so yeah. I think that was, in other words, had Powell couched that listen, we're going to hike this last time and we're done. I don't think the market sells off 600 basis points in December like it did that sharp sell off, because effectively the market's a forward pricing mechanism. That didn't happen. The president's to blame for putting pressure and questioning the independence of the Fed and creating bad optics. And the Fed's to blame because they didn't properly back channel with the White House to make this happen. 
All right. Well, John, uh, listen, we got, I want to move on here because our listeners may uh, are not aware of this yet. And we, we, are, we, we wanted to use this uh, podcast or and this uh, show to actually announce it. But uh, you get the uh, privilege of uh, moderating a, uh, a smackdown between Kevin Muir and myself at the uh, Traders Expo. Uh, and so, uh, just for our listeners' information, so uh, John is actually running at the uh, Chicago Traders Expo, which was running July 21st. Actually, the whole series is on July 21st, but the, the show is 21st to the 23rd of July. But you do a series called the Global Macro Edge Series, right? And so there's a series of, of macro sessions, and one of them you're going to moderate... Kevin Muir and myself going into a session, which is we're calling the bull versus bear smackdown, where our stocks and bonds heading. And uh, well, uh, I, you know, I don't know whether you would be looking forward to watching this gong show of, of Kevin and me going at it, uh, but it's going to be a fun time, isn't it? We're going to crush it, guys. The three of us are going to be <laughs> out of control. And, and, so, and what I love about this is that, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to ask you, tell us a little bit about this Global Macro Edge series and, uh, and what uh, people should expect if they come and join us for that event. Absolutely. So the Global Macro Edge series um, is, is, is a spinoff from uh, the book that I wrote with, with 14 other contributing authors, the Global Macro Edge. And the, the, the ethos of our event is that there's never been more information available to a more diverse group of people than right now. And I think that the, your show, your podcast is emblematic of that, that anyone who wants to empower themselves with information can find the vehicle, can find the channel to make that happen. And so the speakers of part of this really believe that to whom much is given, much is expected. So we put this event on for free. Um, it takes the concepts of the global macro edge, which is applying a fundamental narrative on top of, you know, strategies to, to trade the markets and, and assess things on a return per unit of risk basis. And I'm just thrilled that, that you guys are going to be a part of that. And, and, and we want to, you know, we want to create and put forth stimulating, engaging dialogue. So we structured this much like a, a 20 minute breakout session followed by a five or 10 minute Q and A. And this goes on two or three times a year. We just had one in New York in March. We're doing it obviously July 21st, which uh, you guys will be a part of. And, and I think that, you know, we'll crush it, and, and, and it's a no-holds-barred event, and, and a lot of tough questions, <laughs> a lot of introspection, and and, and I'm going to hold you guys to a high standard BMC as, as your moderator. Well, you know what? Uh, Kev's going down. That's all I have to say. It's a cage match. I still like, uh, Patrick, that you said the privilege. Sean has the privilege of moderating it. <laughs> It's pretty arrogant of you. That's all I can say. Bad fortune of doing it. it Somehow fortune, he didn't know what yeah. he didn't know what he was getting into when he when he signed up for that. I just want to take a second to say the Global Macro Edge, uh, your book, John. I have it. It's a terrific book. I, I I've had it long before I met you. Um, when the young people come to me and say I'm interested in global macro, what should I where should I start? It's one of those books that I that I put people on right up there with Market Wizards. I think it's a terrific book, and uh, we'll make sure we include a link on our. Uh, the email that we send out to everyone because I think it's uh, an indispensable, very uh, practical, and then that's the one thing I would say about it. It's very practical. It's not, and, and it's obvious speaking to you that you're a practical guy that is more interested in kind of trading and figuring out good risk reward setups than talking about what should be or you know whether there's going to be some grandiose change in the dollar status or the federal reserve is going to lose all of its credibility. You're interested in where's the next trade? How can I make some money doing this? And I think it's a great refreshing attitude. All right. Well, listen, Thank you guys. I, I want to, Oh no, John, I just want to uh, do one quick, uh, a shout out. We, we, what we did back in March in Toronto is we did a market huddle meetup uh, where we met up at a bar and we invited all of our listeners to come join us. And uh, Kevin and I have uh, decided that while well, when in Chicago, we have to have another market huddle meetup. So any of our listeners that make it out to the uh, Chicago Traders Expo on July 21st, um, we, uh, after our little smackdown, later that evening, we haven't decided whether it's at 7 or 8, we're going to uh, make the announcement later on, we're going to have 
a market huddle meetup with our listeners. We're going to announce with the bar where we're going to hang out. And, and John, will you be able to uh, join us that evening and, uh, and, and meet many of our listeners? I will join it, but caveat emptor to anyone who attends. This is the sort of, you know, um, after, after you see us, you know, together on stage, you know, I mean, you're not protected by the podcast anymore. You'll be close <laughs> enough incarnate, right? But you've got to really be careful in terms of what, what, could, what could evolve. Because this is alcohol free right now, all right? I, I, so just be careful. Well, everyone, actually, it's if not. You do but that's. Out. John, John um, it's, it, it might be alcohol free on your side, but uh, we kind of <laughs> cheat behind the scenes. <laughs> So uh, no and, and all I can say, Vegas, everyone, ten oh eight in the morning is just fine. You know, there's no last call in yeah. Vegas. <laughs> That's right. Um, the one thing I will say for I'm looking forward to meeting our market huddlers from Chicago. And I think, Patrick, you should all buy him a sour, the nastiest, ugliest sour, since he's always making me drink them. Make sure you buy him one of those because oh. let's see him drink all these terrible beers. Figure out the worst sour you can buy. Um, <laughs> unless you're a millennial, at which point you probably like a sour. Bring your best sour and give me <laughs> Patrick drink <laughs> All right, John, uh, just uh, uh, we're going to have a jo- have you join us in the after hours show here. But but um, just uh, right now, if you can just let everyone know where they can find you, where they can follow your stuff, please uh, just give everyone a quick plug on uh, uh, about you. Sure. Find me on Twitter at at John Netto at J-O-H-N and as Nancy E-T-T-O and everything on my Twitter profile. And uh, it's been an honor to be here today, guys. It's, it's an immense pleasure, and I look forward to crushing it in Chicago with you. All right. Well, John, uh, uh, we look forward to uh, uh, Chicago as well. And listen, uh, stick around, and we'll uh, have you in our after hours, and we'll continue this conversation. Thanks. Absolutely, guys. Thank you.